Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Rachel Rosen. I'm a meta member of the selection committee, um, and it's uh, my pleasure to uh, be here on stage with this uh, magnificent cast and crew of this film, whom I'm going to introduce uh, to you now. Uh, at the far right, it's Keith Beauchamp, a uh, writer and also longtime investigator um, of um, things about the Emmett Till case. Uh, to his left is Sean Patrick Thomas, who plays Gene Mobley. Uh, John Douglas Thompson, who plays Moses Wright. Jalen Hall, our Emmett Till. Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> uh, this empty seat is for uh, Danielle Deadweiler, who is uh, on her way. She's been delayed, but um, I'm sure that will make for a lovely dramatic entrance at <laughs> mid-press conference. Uh, and to my right is Chinoya Chuku, who is the director of Tim. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Exactly. <laughs> well, I also, I heard a, just a few sniffles and nose blowings when I came in, so I, this is a good moment to let everyone get settled uh, into their questions mode. Um, and I just want to start at the very beginning um, and ask about the origins of this film, because I know that Keith Beauchamp has been working on this story for a long time. He made a documentary um, about the case, wondering if you had interest in doing a story about Emmett Till and found the documentary, or if he came to you, just what was the origin of the film? So three years ago, the producers, um, including Whoopi and Barbara and Fred, and um, Michael Riley and Keith, they reached out to me and they wanted to know if I was interested. And this was not too long after I'm, I finished screening my last film, Clemency, and I think, I think Barbara reached out to me like a month after or two months after um, it premiered at, at Sundance and I was not in the emotional space <laughs> to, to, I didn't think I was in the emotional space <laughs> to make this film, um, but you know Barbara is uh, persuasive, and uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so when I met with them, I I was like I, I, for, to myself I was thinking all right I'm gonna come clear about the kinds of parameters and non-negotiables that I'm that I'm I'm only willing to work with, and I was actually expecting them to just you know say that's fine, nice meeting you, goodbye. <laughs> Um, but the, when I met with the producers, um, meeting Whoopi especially, she was so warm and um, I felt so seen by them and they really respected my artistry. And so I told them, you know, the only, first and foremost, the only way I'd be interested in telling this story is if I rewrite the script and, and focus my directorial vision towards Mamie, this being a story about Mamie and her emotional journey and her perspective. And so the narrative is really going to be through her lens primarily. Um, and you know, the producer was like, yeah, yeah, okay, great. And then the second one was, I, I didn't wanna show any physical violence inflicted upon black bodies. And uh, that, that was a non-negotiable for me. And, and they were like, okay, great. And then the third was that I wanted to begin and end in a place of joy and love um, and because in addition to the story being about Mamie's journey, it is also a love story between Mamie and her son. And so they really gave me the space and the creative freedom to really tell this story the way I believe it need, needed to be told. Uh, and, and so it really started from there and then I was able to, I was really fortunate in that, you know, Keith has been spending over 30 years really, you know, he was a men mentee of Mamie's and he's been doing so much um, investigative work and helping to reopen the case, and so we had he was a, he had a treasure trove of information and research that he just passed on to me, and so I was able to really take some time to ingest it all and go to Mississippi a few times and go to Chicago and and um, and speak to a lot of different people, uh, and then uh, yeah, and then we were that kind of laid the foundation for me to really dive in and um, rewrite the script, and then um, in a very short period of time, and then direct the film last year. Amazing. 
Well, I guess I'm going to take it back to the two producers on the stage then, <laughs> um, and ask you what was it um, about Clemency um, that made you reach out to Chinoya and consider her as the director? Well, I can start. Hello, everyone. <laughs> um, it was the way she told the story, that intimate character-driven story. And you know, it was it was something that we wanted to see with Till. I mean, Mother Mobley was a strong figure in my life, and to be able to resurrect her on screen and tell her story that was most important. So that was one of the main, you know, just reasons why we chose Chinaya to direct this. Maybe you can add just a little about um, having directed the documentary, what as producers you thought doing a fictional version of the story could bring to it and why you wanted to develop the film? Well, of course, um, Chinoya made sure that she had the story locked. You know, coming from someone who's researched this for t over, you know, 29 years and um, being that I'm so close to the story itself and everything I wanted to see on screen was the whole story. And of course, document, documentaries are different, yeah. right? Yeah. And so I had to, I mean, she quickly, Chinoya quickly checked me on that. Oh, you, 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 know, you can't do this. We can't put all this in the I'm story. I'm a teddy bear. <laughs> I'm a but, teddy you know, bear. But you know, it was a, a, a good, um, it, was, it, was a, it was a good experience to understand because this is my first major feature narrative documentaries I could do while I'm sleeping, but this is a whole nother ball game. And so, you know, being able to figure out what would be great to have on screen and what would not be great to have on screen, that was a challenge, but we were able to do it. <laughs> <laughs> would you care to add anything about just why, how you became involved as a producer on the film and why you're interested in taking this on as a project? 67, oh shit. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> 67 years. This story's been sitting there for 67 years. Everybody says they know the story. People throw the name out all the time and don't know anything about it. For me, this is this is the same as the diary of Anne Frank. This is truth, this is what happened, and we want you to know so that you can make up your mind and say, you know, this systemic racism really affects all of us, right? So for me, any time, ah, is that ah. the magic woman? Oh, yes. 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 talking. Whoopi was talking. What are y'all doing? Well, I talk a lot all day, every day. So they're like, quiet, girl. Um, so for me, anytime we can visit information and make people smarter and make people recognize that they are involved in all of this, that it starts here with Emmett and those hateful fingers of racism and sexism and all the other isms, they all come from here because this is, what, this is what it looks like. This is what it does. It allows people to come to your house and take your family and do whatever they want to. It allows people to do whatever they want. So gay folks get this movie. Straight folks get it. Black people get it. White people get it. Women get it. It's a movie for everybody. And that's why I want it to be part of it. Also, Fred and Barbara, I've worked with Fred before, I've worked with Barbara before, and, and they don't do crap. 
and I, I've done some crap in my, my career. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I like to be associated <laughs> with non-crap. <laughs> and, you know, that's, that's the other reason I took it. it. As much for myself as for everyone else, you know? Great, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about two things that you mentioned in your first answer. And one was you knowing that you wanted to make Mamie Till Mapry the center of this story when they approached you. Can you sure, I mean, without Mamie, the world, we would not know who Emmett Till was. And so she is the heartbeat of this story, you know, and should be centered. And, and, and you know, black women are so often erased from stories like this, or so often erased from history and the present and everything in between. And so I, that was another reason why I was so adamant about centering this incredible black woman, but humanizing her and really showing her multidimensionality and all of these different aspects of her life that really portray her as more than just grieving mother. You know, and so a lot of, you know, Whoopi was saying that there are a lot of people who, people who think they know the story, but they have no idea. And part of what most of us don't know is the journey that Mamie went on after Emmett was lynched and all of the very intentional strategic things that she did um, while also evolving in her own activist consciousness as well. And so that was just, to me, I just thought that was just such a fascinating and interesting story that I, I wanted to tell. And. I'm going to come to the actors next, but I just want to dig in a little bit um, to the other thing that you mentioned, which is not showing violence against black bodies on screen. And one of the things that impressed me the most about this film is the way you titrated that decision, because on the other hand, the whole point of, or one of the points of Mamie Till Mabry's activism was to force people to look at the hard truth of the violence that was done to her son. So you sort of have two poles that you're working with. But not really. But, right. but exactly. okay, so this but is what I want you to, yeah. so yes, okay, so. I mean, it, 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 what you needed to see was the relationship. You knew what was happening. All you needed to hear was the sound. You knew, you knew what was happening. You didn't need to see us do it but you needed to understand what was done and why Mrs. Mobley made the choice that she did. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, our, our hope was always that we would find somebody who understood the, the, the small things that this movie needed to have, mm -hmm. the respect it needed to pay to the audience. Mm -hmm you know, the respect that the actors needed to pay to each other. She understood that. And so in discussing what we wanted to see and what we really didn't want to see, because we always knew it was going to be a mother-son story, we knew. Mm -hmm. Because it, it, it had to be. Otherwise, it's just another, oh, I've seen this before. But you haven't seen this. Mm -hmm. And when she said, you know, here are the things I want to make sure we do, as soon as she said them, we had made up our mind <laughs> because, it, because we, we knew we had found somebody who would pay attention to the little details that were necessary. And I mean, when you watch it, you know, you think of black people in the South and, you know, in these shacks and you see, you see that, but you don't think of Chicago in 1955 into a young man's bedroom. It's his bedroom. It looks like a bedroom of any 14-year-old kid. It's not toe up, it's not toe down, it's not, it doesn't need to tell you where to go. You follow the path that she has set forth for you to see these people as a family. They are ordinary people who have been thrust into extraordinary times. And that's what we needed y'all to see. And I just want to say, you know, thank you for coming out this morning. Yeah, yeah. It's morning time. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it. It's nice to see folks here. I'm just saying, you know, because you didn't have to. 
This is not, you know, a lot of people scared of this movie. We know that, Keith and I know that. It's taken forever to get this done. So I'm thanking you because I'm so appreciative because it means people do want to see it. People do appreciate it. Love it. Yeah, God. Thank you. Because without Keith, we would have no idea of the lightness of Emmett. We would not have any idea of the beauty of his mother. We wouldn't know without Keith going in and digging that up. Because on, usually in movies, this is the periphery, mm -hmm. you know? But she made it the, the heart, and therefore, the heartbeat for you all. So I'm, now I'm shutting up, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. So I want to turn to the performers. Yes. Because, um, <laughs> yes, you're all so tremendous. Um, but I also recognize that it's an extra level of responsibility to take on the personality of a real person. Um, and I know that you also, uh, from watching Keith's documentary, I know that there's a variety of material that you had to work with. So for instance, Danielle, you had a lot of footage that you could look at of the real Mamie, um, some others of you less so. So I'm just, uh, if each of you could just talk a little bit about um, how you honored the people you were playing while you made the parts of your own. Um, we'll, we'll start down there with you, Sean. Okay. Uh, I played uh, Gene Mobley. And uh, for me, uh, what it was all about was how do I do this in such a way where Gene's family, Gene's loved ones, the people who knew him, would feel uh, respected uh, when they saw the film. And so that was my main concern, just that the people who actually knew him would not feel like he was done any disservice whatsoever. That was very important to me. Um, and so a huge, feel, a huge part of getting to that point was talking for hours to Mr. Beauchamp here, who knew Gene personally, uh, spent many hours and years with them and, and with Mamie and saw them as a couple. And so uh, that really helped me get a sense of, okay, this is my road into doing exactly what I was hoping to do, which was not do a disservice to the man and, and to the relationship. And so uh, Keith and, and discussions with Shinoya and, and reading the autobiography, I was really able to just get a sense of uh, who Gene and Mamie were together as a couple, and uh, take it from there. Um, hello, I'm John Thompson. I play Mose uh, Wright. I think for me the general thing was how do I play this ordinary man, wonderful man, who's thrust into an extraordinary situation? Um, and what that burden is and what the feelings perhaps are. And I felt that I was given a lot of information as it related to uh, my character. There is some uh, footage of him uh, that I was able to find that's on YouTube. I had the uh, FBI transcripts of the trial itself, uh, which was word for word, letter for letter uh, testimony. Um, and I also had some books. There was a wonderful book that was written by Simeon Wright that is about the family uh, and Moe's, his wife, and their children, uh, and about the event itself uh, uh, in its entirety. Uh, and there's also a lovely book by Mamie Till Mobley. Uh, is it called Death of Innocence? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a remarkable book, and it's uh, incredibly written that gives you a wonderful account truly of her love for her son um, and how I work into that and having her son come down to see me in Money, Mississippi. So I had all that information uh, that was given to us as resources and I was just trying to do justice to a character um, or an individual, a real person who this horrible thing happened to him and his family and loved ones and was there any redemption? Was there a way to hopefully in some ways make things right, which then hopefully for my character happens by the time we get to the trial scene in what my character actually decides to do, which 
no black man at that time had done something like that without losing their life. So it was really just trying to follow a track of uh, an individual thrust into, as I said, an extraordinary situation and try to come out of that in the seeking of redemption. Um, hi, my name is Jalen Hall and I play Matil. Uh, a lot of what we know about him is things that you can read or pictures that you can see, but thanks to the guidance from these beautiful people to the left and right of me, <laughs> um, I got to learn a lot. I got to learn a lot. And one of the things about Emmett is that you see him as somebody in history who was a pivotal, was a pivotal moment, but you never really think about that he was just a 14-year-old kid. He was regular. He may have liked to play video games or wanted to go to the moon. Who knows, you know? But it's just that innocence and that purity of heart and that love that I wanted so desperately to, to embody. Um, just showing you that he was just like anybody else who just wanted to have fun and be curious. Um, so taking, taking the traits, the personality traits that I learned and they shared with me, I just put that all into my performance with still showing you what a human being, what a child, a, a black boy who loved his mother that Emmett Till was. You nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm a grandmother. I've been a grandmother since I was 33. I knew a lot about being a grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that because grandmothers do stuff to mothers, their children, that are annoying. <laughs> they say, let him go. <laughs> let him go. It's, it's just, his, he's going to see his family. What is the problem? I've done that to my daughter, often. But the outcome was not the same. So I understood it. I understood that. Um, and for me, I just was glad to be <laughs> I was just glad to be here. Because I, I hadn't intended to do it. And they said, no, no, we want we want you to do that. I say, are you sure? Because, <laughs> you know, I'm iffy with a lot of people. And they said, shut up and be here when you're supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what I did. Sick and lame, but I, I got there. I got there. And so it was a marvel to watch everyone because I haven't been living this material as long as Keith has, but I've been living with it for a long time. And to see, to see Emmett come alive. Mm. To see him come, it was, it was a marvel to see. And so I'm going to slip over here because mm. this was the other marvel. Woo! Yes. <laughs> Danielle Deadwiler, everybody. Yes. Yes. You, know, you don't get to see it often, yep. but when you do see it, yep. you recognize yep. it, and you are incandescent. Yes. As Mamie, I, 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 when I saw the because we, when you're on set, you know, you think, oh, girl, you know my leg, I got a cramp in my leg. Oh, really? Girl, girl, what are you doing yep. for lunch? Are you gonna eat? Yeah, I'm gonna eat. And then you hear action, and then you're in it. But then when you see it, it, you took my breath away. Mm. I, I, I just, I can't stop saying it. You, you're just spectacular. Revelation. That's enough. That's enough. <laughs> yes, he's a star. You want me to answer? Oh, yes. yes I do. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can answer. Um, um, this is one of those um, uh, experiences where you just know that you have an extreme amount of weight that you have to bear. There's no other um, way to engage it. Uh, uh, Janoi and I had the good talks, uh, the long talks. Um, uh, I've been knowing about uh, Mamie Till's story and Emmett Till's story since I was a kid, since I was in elementary school. My mother was born in 1955. 
it's just a year that ringed for that rang for me a long time um, since I'd known it, and we just did the good deep dive um, in all the ways academically, a number of theses and uh, and and Mamie's memoir served as Bible, um, um, poetry, music. Uh, um, all of those things, the archival footage, the photos, all of those things just continue to swirl daily. You know, the months in building up to production, all through production, and these things have stayed with the entire time. They still live in my phone, in my, in my mind, in my life, in our lives, right? So, um, that uh, it's not one of those things you can, you can easily dispense of. We're not allowed. In a way, we're not allowed. And I guess that's why they're scared, right? Maybe. So um, we should be, we should be, and we should confront it nonetheless. So um, that's my experience in, in building and, and living with it. Well, thank you for yeah, going through that process, all of you. Um, I think we're gonna take a couple of questions from the audience. I don't know if there are microphones. Yes, there are mics. Okay, so um, let's just start front row in the center. Well, the question wasn't whether or not to show the body, it was really how to do it, right? My decision to show the body on, to show the body on screen was an extension of Mamie's decision that she made in 1955. And so in order to honor her and the decisions she made um, that was so critical to you know, us and the civil rights movement and her story, the we had to. The question was how to do it. And I approached it in a way where when we're first in the funeral home, the body is obstructed and we're just with Mamie, and we stay in her emotional perspective. Because in that scene, what that scene is about is more of us understanding where Ma what Mamie's emotional processing is as she has seen the body for the first time, right? And so, and then when we really see a clear view of Emmett's face and the body, it's with the large crowd in the church, and I wanted to, replicate the experience of the world witnessing what happened to Mamie's son, Emmett, um, in a very visual and cinematic way. And so I knew that the best way to do it was to do it sparingly yet effectively. And so the moment that I decide that in the story where we need to see the body, it'll, I knew it was probably only gonna be once, <laughs> um, but it needed to really have narrative and emotional impact. Um, and then we're done. And you also, what you did with that, I'm just jumping into your sure. question, but the other thing that she did was she allowed us to know Emmett's body the way his mom yes. was getting to know. Yes. Which, when she says in the courtroom, I know, that I know my son, yep. you know. When you see her and she's touching each, mm -hmm. each place, you stop being, <gasps> by it and you realize that you're seeing a mother touching her son and it allows you to be part of it. And I, I just thought that was a wonderful way to go about it. I, I, you did, I thought it was just magnificent. Thank you. Yeah. I concur, it's a humanizing of his body as opposed to uh, associating it and affiliating it only with the violence that was enacted upon it. Comparatively, we look at what happens to black people's bodies today when we look at the violence that is enacted on them and that is not done with a critical care. That's an eye that is trying to uh, get someone in a gotcha moment, that is um, trying to do something defensively as opposed to this is critical care for the wellness of the narrative and the story of his life and critical care for the, the aftermath of what happens to black people as a result of her showing it to everyone. Yeah. Right. Humanizing, not objectifying. Right. Uh, yes, okay, there in the purplish. Oh, I love this question. <laughs> Let me get comfortable. Um, <laughs> so 
when I tell you I love the language of cinema, that absolutely includes sound and music and the relationship that they have to picture, right? Um, Abel Korzeniowski. Yes, the composer of Till and a brilliant composer just in general. I am a film score junkie and uh, he was on my wish list of composers to get for this film. And we talked extensively <laughs> for many, 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 many months about the music of the film, about the sounds of the film. And we, we had talked about emotional subtext. You know, what I love, I love a score that does more than just underlining what we see on picture. And so the conversations, the endless conversations Abel and I had was we literally went scene by scene of the film and talked about whose scene is it and what is going on emotionally. So one of, and, and, and how do we underscore that? So an example, a, one, a great example of that was when we were talking about the scene where Mamie is seeing Emmett's body for the first time. Visually, it is, um, it's, it's, it's a painful, sad, tender, humanizing moment. Part of the subtext, and this is one of the things Danielle and I talked about when we were talking about this scene, because she, she actually, we went through this, she actually did this scene as part of her, a part of our director session, a part of our callback, was we talked, Abel and I talked about the rage, the anger that's building up inside of her um, that leads to her making that decision by the end of the scene. So Abel, so Abel scored the film highlighting that emotional subtext um, because then that is going to complement what we see visually. And so we talked about that often. We also use the language of, we, of horror um, when talking about certain moments when she is seeing him off and she has that intangible knowing um, that, is, that has been inside of her, especially when she sees Emmett off and that when she gets the news that he was found, his body was found. That's why I use the Zolly shot because that was something that I've, I've, I've I, I've seen used effectively in horror films and the horror of that moment. And so the soundscape that was discussed was we don't want it to be like a, a you know, cheesy horror sounding, you know, psycho, whatever, but, <laughs> you know, movie. But how do we, how do we do it in a, how do we um, communicate that horror in a sophisticated way um, that still is favoring Mamie's emotional moment? And so, um, and also the use of silence, because I think I believe silence is also just as important as the soundscape and the music. And so I was also very intentional about those moments of silence that can juxtapi juxtapose against those more those louder moments. So when we see Mamie in the train station receiving Emmett's body in, in, in that box, the music crescendos and it's, very, it's almost deafening and then we cut to this chilling silence to respect the moment that is going on, but that, that's go, that, to respect Mamie's moment with her son. And so I, 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 I have a field day doing, thinking about this stuff, you know, silence and soundscapes and music, but all of it is to be an extension of the storytelling and the emotional beats and subtext of the characters within the scenes. I think we have time for one more. Let's go, sorry, we'll, we'll do two more. We'll do you and you. <laughs> yeah, let's start on the, whoever you can get to first. There's a shot of the oh. wallet, of him holding up the wallet in and that scene, and name? it's, it's Hetty Lamar. Hetty Lamar, yeah. yeah. So he was in those Hedy wallets. Yeah. yeah, so we Hedy see Lamar. it in see it. the store, we see it in his bedroom, and then we see a, a close, like a, a shot of it clearly wow. in, the, in the scene, um, in that scene that you're talking about. We see that shot, and then we cut to the medium of Carolyn. Very good, thank you. No problem. All right. We're, get, we're gonna take a question from this <coughs> gentleman here in the blue shirt with the white mask. Well, I first need to acknowledge some department heads. Our costume designer, Marcy Rogers. Yes. 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 Marcy. <laughs> Our production designer, Kurt Beach and our cinematographer, Bobby Bukowski. <laughs> they did the thing. Uh, 
<laughs> they did the thing. Did. <laughs> um, and so, you know, what I, my, the, the first set of conversations I had with Marcy, Kurt, and Bobby is that I want a vibrant color palette. I want the clothes, the production design, the lighting to be, uh, to reflect the vibrancy, the beauty, and the richness that is black people and black communities and black spaces. Um, and so that, is, that informs the bright, the, the bright wardrobe pieces and, you know, and that time period, the production, you know, the wallpaper, that was fitting for the time period. And so we just ramped it up a bit, you know, and, um, and, and that was also what Bobby did with the lighting. And uh, so, so that was integral. And then in terms of the cinematography, you know, Bo Bobby and I had a lot of conversations about framing and compositional choices because what is in the frame and what, what's out of the frame is just as important as what's in the frame, right? And how do, who, do we, who are we centering? Whose gaze are we centering? And who are we intentionally in excluding? And so a uh, very clear example of that is the testimony scene. Mm -hmm. And which, I mean, Dania, I just need to give you another round of applause for this. <laughs> So, you know, when planning, when talk, when I, whenever I talk about any aspect of uh, any aspect of the film with any department head, but especially my cinematographer, all of the creative decisions that we discuss always have to be rooted in the storytelling. And so, when we were getting ready to shoot the scene of Mamie's testimony, Bobby and I had like eight or nine different setups that we thought were going to communicate. <laughs> eight or nine different setups of what we thought were going to communicate the complexity of Mamie's emotional moments throughout that extraordinary performance. And so the first, the first setup was what we saw on the film. Yeah. After that first take, I was like, damn. <laughs> I think everybody was like, damn. <laughs> and then the second take, Bobby and I looked at each other and we're like, I think we're good. I don't think we need to do anything else. So when I talk about framing and compositional choices, I had to make some adjustments because as Danielle was just, I mean, channeling, transforming, I don't know what you call that, a revelation. I knew in order to make this scene work as a one-er, I had to adjust the framing and composition and be, cl and be clear to suggest the world beyond the frame. So bringing in the hands of the, of the lawyer and the, and the rings and the photos and rack focusing from the jury to Mamie. You know, so I needed to make sure that I set, I, I'm cl we're clear about the spatial relationships and we're clear about you know, who is speaking to her, but we didn't need anything beyond that because the um, narrative and emotional focus is right here, right? And so, we, yeah, we had eight or nine other shots planned, but in, that, in, in being present in this extraordinary moment that we all got to witness in Danielle's performance, it became clear that there were more ways to communicate that kind of emotional subtext that we wanted. And so those are the kinds of conversations that were ongoing between my cinematographer and I when it comes to the visual language of the film. Thank you. All right, I know there's another show in here, but if we You answer that. Wait, <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, we have, to, like, we have like two seconds. How relevant is this film today? No, no, you, you, you know how relevant this film is today. <laughs> and it's more relevant every day. And it ties in more and more people. Because again, what you see is the culmination of everything that we are all living right now. And it's not just us anymore. And so it's Im really important that everybody recognizes what, what institutional racism looks like. Mm -hmm. Because we are slipping further and further and further. And unless we can show people what this actually means in terms of people walking in your house, because they don't care who you are, and you don't matter to them as a human being. If we're not careful, we may be facing this again, and it's, I feel, imperative to everybody to say, you know what, I don't think we want to do this anymore. We, we, we recognize that we didn't like it when we saw Trayvon Martin, 
lose his life. We recognized we didn't like it when we saw Breonna Taylor lose her life. We knew that we didn't like it when we saw uh, George Floyd lose his life. And now we've taken you to point A and say, from here spreads all of this. And we can stop it if we choose to. That's what this is about. This is about all of us. This Emmett Till is all your brothers and sisters, your husbands, your boyfriends, your lovers. That's who Emmett Till is. And then, you know, so there you go. Uh, I want to thank you all so much for coming and sharing the film with us. Uh, if you could stay in your seats um, so um, this lovely cast and crew can exit uh, theater, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you all it. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.